The theme of the paper takes two social forms, the institution and public space, and proposes a relationship between them at a moment when the forms and the kinds of relations and spaces that they represent are mutating at an accelerated pace. So at stake in the theme is a question about the kinds of social relations that we're capable of instituting or imagining at this moment in time. A problem that arises in discussion about this is that the terms themselves are, so, are sort of broadly used, so much so that they can generate a lot of slippage in meaning. So, for my contribution, I thought I would reflect on certain meanings associated with the terms and how those meanings are shifting as a way to think about this proposed relationship and the implications for cultural practice. So institutions are complex systems made up of architectures and procedures. And what I'm going to do is focus just on one aspect of institutions, which is the way that they function as mechanisms to shape social relations. The kinds of social relations that they generate arise from the practices, the representations, and the discourses that they produce, which is to say, <coughs> from their ways of instituting. So Irish Water is a semi-state body newly instituted to manage a common resource and to develop a vital infrastructure. Privatisation of water is a global drive, with organisations like the World Bank actively pushing for public-private delivery of water in developing countries. However, water is a basic human need and is understood by many to be a basic human right. So matters of governance and matters of common interest are involved here, which makes it, in my assessment, a relevant site for consideration of institutions public space at this moment. Now the kind of mechanism that this institution, Irish Water, is, in terms of a shaping of social processes and relations, is wonderfully apparent in a short ad that they, that they produced in 2013 as part of their initial awareness campaign. The purpose of this 50 second film, as you will see, is to take a set of ideas about water, about the concept of natural resources, about community and citizenship, about commodification and publicness, and to rework those ideas through a particular frame of value. The value-laden form of those ideas is then represented as though they were depoliticized matters of common sense, which is of course exactly how ideology works. So, got a 50 second form to play. It's something we've learned to trust and harness through our knowledge, hands, and hard work. It's shaped who we are and who we can become. But as demand rises, we have less to spare. We need to join together and change. Change how we invest in water services and help provide jobs for the future. Change the way we pay for our water supply and wastewater treatment. And change how we safeguard Ireland's most precious resource after its people. Irish Water, safeguarding your water for your future. So in a second, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, oh, Tom's going to do for me. I'm going to play it again um, without the sound. I'm just going to talk over it. Um, but just before I do that, um, I want to just say a couple of things. Obviously, a lot of ideological material is packed into that short film using visual codes, audio textures, and the packaging of ideas as narrative and spoken text. Um, the two primary visual codes that I have found, maybe some of you might find some more, are transparency, as you would expect, and more surprisingly, a general whiteness. There are two non-white people, but they are mostly hidden by white things, um, as you will see. So would you mind playing about this part? Okay, so the underlying suggestion of the visual and audio narrative in the opening section seems to be that nature cannot be relied upon to provide, that water is part of a scarcity economy. The slight sense of anxiety, instability and threat is underscored by the descending notes of the opening music, which begins to ascend once the water enters the sphere of technology. The spoken text presents two sets of ideas that are particularly relevant to my argument here. The first is the obvious attempt to naturalise the process of commodification 
of subjecting a commons like water to market rules. The other important ideological statement comes at the end, when water is described as Ireland's most valuable resource after its people. So the Irish people are not defined as citizens or as a public, but as a resource. And I think that's a fairly significant rewriting of ideas about publicness and democracy. <laughs> Okay, so the other social form that I'm addressing here is public space, which refers, broadly speaking, to a mesh of interwoven political and economic interests, relations, and cultures of the everyday. As a concept, public space is pretty complex, shading off into related concepts like the public realm and the public sphere, which are neither especially distinct as phenomena, nor are they identical or interchangeable. Matters of power, matters of discourse, and matters of space are entangled together in different ratios in each of those terms. In general, public is a value term used to refer broadly to ideals associated with democracy, including the matter of common interest. It's a term that crops up regularly in political and media discourse, suggesting that it is somehow integral to the way that our society functions. <coughs> However, as Simon Sheik has pointed out, public is a historical term based on 19th century ideas of citizenship and subjectivity that do not necessarily correspond to the type of social formation in which we find ourselves right now. Technically, the definition of public realm is a territory in which the public is sovereign, but common usage of the term today refers to areas to which the public has access, and that shift from the principle of sovereignty to one of mere access reflects a more general erosion of the public functions of the state through the political economic processes that are grouped under the term neoliberal capitalism. Or neoliberalism. <coughs> neoliberalism is effectively a concrete restructuring of the world of social interaction and experience. Neoliberal ways of instituting prioritize efficiency over other values like equality or publicness. So the ideological construction of that short film is not only about preparing the population to accept Irish water, it's part of a broader program to define the conditions of how we might think about the common, to naturalise a private public paradigm in the place of the public realm. So the process of subjecting matters of common interest to market rules, which obviously I touched on in relation to this phenomenon of water, is also very visible in the educational institutions. Contemporary education is being reshaped as a strategy to accumulate economic, social and cultural capital, which enables individuals to position themselves in a competitive international market. The self is being refashioned as an enterprise, which must retain a competitive edge, and that I think is the real meaning of lifelong learning. Education is becoming a major site in the formation of neoliberal subjectivities far removed from an idea of education as an emancipatory tool, or as the passing of knowledge and experience from one generation to the next, which has long been understood as a common good. <coughs> so the book block protests, I just have three slides here. Uh, I thought uh, what was really interesting about it was the way that they grasped exactly the need to give a representational form to the state's attacks on education in the production of these shields in the uh, form of books. And so here is one of the resulting images from that. <coughs> so the gradual saturation of social and common life with the logic of the market, of course, has implications for the public sphere, which in theory is supposed to function as a kind of buffer zone between private interests, the market, and the state, a free space in which to debate matters of common interest with a view to speaking back to power. The very idea of the public sphere as a coherent, inclusive, or transparent unity has always been a utopian fiction, of course. From its inception in the ancient Greek Agora, the public sphere was based on mechanisms of exclusion. And throughout the modern era, substantial social groups, including women and workers, were excluded from the space of public opinion formation, as were vital social issues like the material conditions of production, reproduction, and sexuality. Nancy Fraser theorised a multiplicity of public and counter-public spheres 
coexisting and interacting. There are conflicting views on whether the internet constitutes a public space or a public sphere, whether its inclusive and participatory character creates a democratic forum, or whether the clamour of circulating opinion masks the difficulty of speaking back to power, functioning as a kind of repressive tolerance that Paolo Bruno calls publicness without a public sphere. In 1972, the German theorists Necht and Kluge argued that Habermas's reflections on the bourgeois public sphere needed to be supplemented with reflections on what they called the public spheres of production and the proletarian public spheres. The latter was conceived by Necht and Kluge not necessarily as spheres of the proletariat, but as the leftovers from the dominant public sphere, the excluded, vague, unarticulated impulses of resistance or resentment that arise from a discontent with official public narrative. So there are some great examples of this to be seen in the anti-water charges protest materials. I've just got an ad hoc collection of some of these and I have to thank some of my students who are in the audience who actually sent me some of these materials. I'm sure that <coughs> some of you anyway are familiar with the Russian theorist Mikhail Bakhtin's work on the medieval carnival the function of which was to temporarily invert the social order, permitting subjects to mock and denigrate authority for a limited time. His study included a chapter about laughter in which he argued that in resisting hypocrisy, laughing truth degraded power. That's a quote from Bakhtin. He described this as an unleashing of the people's power, which was not merely intended to mock, but to regenerate the entire social system. Another idea of Bakhtin's that seems relevant here um, is that of grotesque realism, <coughs> the principle of which is also degradation. The word arse features a lot. <laughs> 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 so the grotesque body is a comic figure of profound ambivalence associated with primal needs like <laughs> eating, drinking, defecating and sex. So what we're seeing in these communications is a form of speaking back to power in terms contrary to institutional narratives. People know that language is vulnerable to distortion and appropriation by powerful interests, and that the terms of public debate are often framed within unacknowledged ideologies. So these protests seem to me to use a degraded language of the grotesque that refuses those narratives. Sorry. So the best to last. Okay, so staying with the idea of protest as a form of speaking back to power. Uh, this is the Standing Man, as it became known, which took place about two weeks into the Gezi Park protests in Istanbul in 2013, after three days of particularly brutal police repression of demonstrations. This was the night of June 17th, and the normally busy taxi square was strangely quiet and empty, following waves of mass arrests that had cleared the streets. So Erdem Gunduz entered the square, uh, put his hands in his pockets, and stood still in silence, staring pointedly towards a representation of Kemal Ataturk. Within hours, he had been joined by hundreds of others. This spontaneous choreography of vulnerable, precarious agency by visibly weak subjects was a form of speaking back to power that refused speech altogether, a counter-public rendered mute by the ideological capture of language in the dominant public sphere. The demand for recognition as citizens was based on nothing but the raw, undefended presence of bodies in public space. So theorists like Ranciere and Zizek have used the term post-political to describe the foreclosure of radical and active equality that results from neoliberal enclosures, whether those are linguistic, spatial, or otherwise. In the post-political context, 
the term public, I suggest, um, becomes a term under erasure, meaning that we can't do without it, but that what it signifies is somehow inadequate for the circumstances. Simon Sheikis used the arguably more practical term post-public, not in the sense of being after public, but as a critical re-examination of the late motifs and basic modalities of publicness. So to review just the points I've been making so far before I shift direction ever so slightly. First of all, I'm putting forward a, a widely held view that the dominant social institutions in their ways of instituting are becoming or have already become mechanisms to shape social relations primarily in the terms of the market. The second point that I've been making is that under neoliberalism, democracy is effectively decoupled from the principle of equality and it has become increasingly difficult to speak back to power in these conditions. To continue to use the term public in the context of these changes may blind us to the challenges but also the possibilities of the emerging conditions captured by the term post-publicness. I said at the outset that the subtext of this theme was the kinds of social relations that we're capable of instituting or imagining at this moment in time. Which brings me to my final point, which is that informal ways of instituting in the field of cultural practice are often synonymous with an idea of forms of agency that can withstand or refuse the onslaught of marketization. So I want to look at some of the ways that cultural practices raise or address questions about this kind of agency through the exploitation or the creation of gaps or cracks in conditions of post-publicness. Okay, if we take the space in public space literally, we have to understand, of course, that space is not an empty container, but something that is both productive of and produced through social relations. A lot of urban development is characterized by what Stephen Flusty called paranoid space, which is made jittery and prickly and slippery by design, according to Flusty. These constructions of paranoid space work against the gathering and mingling of bodies necessary for publicness. So in opposition to this, many spatial practitioners worldwide are working to produce hybrid, porous and flexible spaces that function as urban commons, producing publics and sustained processes of collective agency. This is the Park Fiction Project, which began in 1994, evolving out of a campaign by a residents association against the development of a site in the harbour area of Hamburg. Through an incredibly lengthy collective planning process, the association managed to have a public park put in place of the proposed private residential development. One of the most successful strategies was to act as if a park already existed. So to this end, the group organized a series of public events in the site, including exhibitions, open air screenings, concerts and talks about what a park could be. The continual use of the space as a park by residents and visitors made the park a social reality. And equally, the space in question produced that public. <coughs> Park fiction was not aiming for an orderly process of alternative urban planning, but the opening of, and I'm quoting here, a wild process of desire production at the intersection of the everyday and the imaginary. That's a quote from the artist Christoph Schaefer, who's involved uh, with the process from the beginning. Drawing on the idea of desire as a productive revolutionary force, following Deleuze and Guattari, the collective production of desires was a key concept of the park fiction process. The desire in this case is envisaged as a force that lies between people rather than in individuals. And that desiring production can lead to a kind of excess that intrudes into the ontologically or politically stable order of things, hence its revolutionary character. Is, uh, they have an archive of desires that were produced during the process, and those very much informed the design of the park. Um, it, it kind of reflects this archive of desires. <coughs> so, queer activists have always had to put their bodies on the line in the production and performance of contrary desires. So by way of an introduction to the second set of practices that I want to talk about here, I'm going to read you a quote from The Queer Art of Failure by Judith Halberstam. Under certain circumstances, failing, losing, forgetting, 
unmaking, undoing, unbecoming, not knowing, may in fact offer more creative, more cooperative, more surprising ways of being in the world. Failing is something queers do and have always done exceptionally well. So, this is a work by the South African artist, Stanley Patraruga, and it combines that sort of embodied interrogation of issues of gender and sexuality with a post-colonial sensibility in his articulation of the first world, third world dynamic that operates in South Africa. <coughs> Hidden transcripts of domination and subordination overlap in this work to do with race, with gender, and with geopolitics. Now when this work was restaged for the Venice Biennale two years ago, it seemed strangely deflated to me, in spite of being more elaborate and more extravagant. And I thought about it quite a bit. I looked at it from the point of view of aesthetics. I considered it in terms of the kind of spectacle art market and in relation to colonial reappropriation. But none of those explanations satisfied me. And it wasn't until I examined what was going on in quite a different work that I began to understand what I was seeing here. So that work was Silence of the Sheep by the Egyptian artist Amal Kanawi. She, in 2009, she led a group of people, mostly men, um, volunteers and hard workers, crawling on their hands and knees across one of the main intersections in Cairo. And Kanawi's intention was partly to address the complacence of the Egyptian populace in the face of corruption and dictatorship. This was well before the Tahrir Square protests. It's reported that the performance was badly received by the people of Cairo. The procession was followed by a jostling, heckling crowd who challenged the artist and the performers in fairly hostile language, leading to a bit of a fracas and the arrest of the artist and the performers. Now, what made this act socially unacceptable had to do with specific local conditions, which are interesting, but they're not the focus of my argument. I'm interested more generally in the way that the raw presence of these bodies in space activated the police order. Not necessarily the police as such, but what Roncier describes as the order which determines what can be seen and what can be said through a classification of bodies that allocates ways of doing, ways of saying, and ways of being, maintaining patterns of inclusion and exclusion. <coughs> So looking again at the restaging of Patra Ruga's work in Venice, I realised that what made the work so flat for me was that the police order, which it might aggravate in other contexts, and which I think is present in the first iteration of the work there, uh, was put on hold. In the institutional space of art, of which the Venice Biennale is a prime example, the police order is in a state of relative suspension, I propose. And while that has benefits in terms of creating a space for experimentation, it also insulates the work of art from the systemic violence that operates elsewhere, including the systemic violence impli implied by the erasure of public or public under erasure. The risks associated with provoking the police order can be very high, but the risks of not provoking the police order start to look like acquiescence. <coughs> so to conclude, Post-public is, I propose, a condition of diminishing equality, but it is not a uniform condition. There are points where the police order is more benign, and points where it is more vicious. There are points where negotiation with power is possible, and points where hidden transcripts can be brought to the surface. Political ways of instituting seem more likely in current conditions to emerge from friction rather than from consensus. Although, as a colleague of mine says, we are under mounting pressure to act as though we operate in a frictionless present. In cultural discourse, there is a lot of talk about dissent, which is made possible perhaps by the suspension of the police order that I've already referred to. Practices of dissent, however, cultural and otherwise, are bringing their desiring productions out from the relative shelter of institutions, risking confrontation with all that we understand by the term police. Thank you.